So I just want to say a few things. First off, if you need any help, uh, the, the KISTI board members are all wearing this, and you want to stand up. Uh, there, uh, you can talk to any of them. We want to improve this every year, so if you've got any suggestions or any uh, problems, uh, please contact them. And we're being supported. Yes. Uh, and we're being supported by our STLP students, and uh, they're all in blue. So if you need any assistance, uh, and we have we have volunteers that are in yellow T-shirts and. I see a couple in the in the audience now, so uh, if you get a chance, uh, they they are helping us immensely, and, and this is how we put it together. It's a team effort. We're trying to work to make sure everything's good. Uh, one thing that you should know is tonight's uh, membership only um, reception is at the Sports and uh, Social Club on at Four Street Lot. Uh, it's at 5:30, and you need a ticket in order to get in. Uh, if you're if you're not a member and would like to be a member, uh, the reception area has has the uh, a ticket for you, and you could get that. So that'll be tonight. It's limited to 300 people, and so the first 300 are the ones that are going to get in. Uh, so uh, get there, and uh, everything will be fine. There is supposed to be some inclement weather. Uh, we're anticipating it at, at around 6 o'clock, so we'll be inside. But if you don't know, there's a skywalk that goes from this hotel all the way uh, over towards 4th Street Lodge. So you do not have to uh, walk in whatever rain or snow we, we wind up getting. Uh, but remember, to get in, you'll need to bring your ticket. So that's, that's key. Um, let's see. Oh, oh tomorrow? Closing session, your uh, your ID card will be collected at the door, and that'll be uh, how we're going to pick the prizes. And there's lots of prizes from everything from compute, uh, from like uh, ten dollar gift certificates at Starbucks to uh, uh, television sets. So please come, enjoy yourself, and uh, and we'll work that. Uh, Kisty's opening, our keynote speaker uh, is being. Uh, sponsored by uh, KET, and uh, the members from KET are here, and Julie Schmidt, uh, she's been with KET for, since 2006. She's the senior uh, and director of external affairs. So, uh, Julie, you want to... Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. I'm truly honored to be here today and also really inspired. It's, you know, I don't work in this area day in, day out, and I hear about it, I see what you all are doing in the classrooms across the Commonwealth. And on behalf of Kate, we're just truly excited to partner with you. Um, the work you're doing is, is just amazing. In addition to the programs that you might see on KET day in, day out, from Masterpiece Theater, Downton Abbey, or Nova, Kentucky Life, KET also works in producing high quality, standards-based resources that impact learning and help student achievement. We're, we provide a wide range of resources for all age levels, from youngest children to our adults. That includes preschool learning to our GED preparation materials that are truly used nationally across America. Through KET Encyclopedia and Kentucky iTunes U, we provide teachers and students thousands of digital videos, interactives, and other media. Kentucky students can also take foreign languages through KET, uh, AP Physics or AP Latin, and fulfill their arts and humanity requirements through our distance learning programs. We offer resources in the arts, history, literacy, and workplace readiness, and we provide online and hands-on multimedia workshops at KET or in schools. We're there to help with you and to assist you. We've had a long history of harnessing technology to enhance and enrich learning, and we're excited to partner with Kentucky educators and students. And now our speaker. We're just thrilled to have Michael J. with us today in the Commonwealth. He's devoted his career to innovations in teaching and learning. 
As a longtime educator, Michael taught science in California, where he also worked on the development of technology and the curriculum materials. In 1986, he joined the Classroom of Tomorrow project at Apple Computer. And he also was one of the authors of California's groundbreaking science framework of 1990, a true pioneer. He left Apple to pursue the development of his own patented technology that correlates curriculum, standards, and instructional resources. As the founder of MediaSeq Technologies, he laid the groundwork for many of today's innovations in standards, implementation, and instructional resource integration. He went on to serve as Director of Education Business Development of N2H2 and as Vice President and General Manager at Granium Technologies. Michael has served on many boards and always looking at the relationship between technology and education. Throughout his career, Michael has created lasting changes in how we learn and teach. His work and his vision have resulted in increased efficiency, improved understanding of the K-12 environment, and the development of innovative yet sustainable solutions for the education community. So please join and give him a warm Kentucky welcome to Michael J. DeKisti. for having me here. I asked for the wobbler because I can never stand in one place at any one time. So um, I'll be running around a little bit here. Uh, thanks for having me in Kentucky. I do remember actually uh, from way back in the 80s when I saw KET um, media and other materials that I was using in the classroom. So I know that you guys have always been a real leader um, in terms of instructional technology. So I appreciate the opportunity. Um, today, I'm here to really uh, talk with you, although it's about technology, it's, it's somewhat less about technology than it is about good teaching and learning, uh, as it always is. And I think for those of you who have been doing this for a while, the more you do it, the more you recognize there's some real fundamental truths that really transcend the technology itself. And the real challenge that we have is learning how we integrate the new technology with good teaching and learning. So that'll be really our conversation in today's um, presentation. So the questions I have um, that hopefully you share as well um, are uh, what does a next generation learner actually need? What are the things that they need as we look at moving ahead? I think when many of us went to school, um, you know, I, you knew what you might want to be, you knew where you wanted to go. Um, it's sobering to think about the fact that students who are entering school today are going to end up retiring in the year 2065. Um, I don't know what people are going to be doing in 2065, right? I mean, clearly, if you're a fan of the Jetsons, they're going to be flying around in cars. Um, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, it's hard to say. What, what's, what role does school play in the future? And I purposely put school in quotes because I don't even know what school really means. And I think we're already seeing those kinds of challenges. And I think that stands before us as educators. Um, how does the child's role change in terms of education? We'll look into that. What is the educator's role in that whole process? What are the things that you do that are different? And uh, what uh, will it take to make this kind of change? And what role do you have? Not just in responding, but being an active participant in that process. So if we take a look at change, there are certainly are any number of different models. But if we take a, a look at sort of a natural selection evolution approach to change, we really have two important um, different options here. One is the idea of gradualism, the idea that there's this sort of gradual change that happens over time. And another one would be sort of this punctuated equilibrium where, in fact, there, there's a stasis for a while, things stay the same, and then there's sudden change. Um, and I, I think it's a good philosophical conversation about how do you think, think about this yourself, what is your vision about educational change? And you want to think about that at a variety of different levels, uh, very different when you look at it at a state, national, international level in terms of change versus what happens in your district, in your school in terms of change. And being aware of that and discussing that amongst uh, your colleagues is really important in terms of really explicitly understanding what is it going to take to create that kind of change. I think it also addresses the kind of frustration that we all experience about 
how am I possibly going to create the change that I need within, within my school, within my district? Um, and the sort of drudgery that comes from not seeing the kind of change that you want. What is that going to look like? So important to take a look at what kind of change belief do you have? So what do you think? Gradualism or punctuated equilibrium? And um, where does the kind of selective pressure come from in terms of how that actual change takes place? Is it from your community? Is it from within? Um, is it from superintendent? Um, is it from state legislation from the top down? I'm, I'm censoring myself. There's a little filter inside my head um, about sort of where I think that kind of change comes from. Um, uh, but you know, think about it yourself and think about your role um, in that process. So I think this dam metaphor is really important, which is if I take a look at this dam up here, um, what I see is a dam. I don't know what's behind that dam at all. And, and I'll put before you that I think that if we think about that dam as really holding back that water from moving ahead, um, if we take a look at the change that's taking place in education today, I think that the water is pretty darn high behind that dam. Um, I think that, in fact, the dam is really, really stretching at its very limits right now. I think we see lots of cracks in the face of that dam. We see students who are selecting not to complete high school as they have in the past. We have um, students who are advancing through other methods. There are universities that, in fact, have students have the scores, um, they're able to actually move to college without actually graduating from high school with a traditional degree. We see students opting out, parents opting out of our traditional schools. Um, we see that there's some real changes in terms of the nature of how we think about education. So important to take a look at, we can't tell anything about the water level there, but of course if we look at an alternative view, we can see that that water is completely high. Look for those cracks in the dam, look for those opportunities where change is happening. Um, and uh, what scares me is to think that we could lose uh, a very strong public education system because we're not responding well to that kind of change. Um, and think about uh, how we can actually continue to evolve the way our schools are and not just hold on to the past, but think about how we can move ahead. I think it's important that we look at who the changing learner is. Who is the learner in today's schools? Uh, you know, the tendency, of course, is that all of us were pretty successful in school, and that's why we're involved in formal education. If we look at sort of the traditional child, um, here's Billy. You may be familiar with Family Circus. We used to read this a lot as a kid. Um, so the teacher says, remember, class, the shortest distance from point A to point B is a straight line. Well, for those of you who remember Family Circus here, um, Billy almost never took a straight line from point A to point B. Um, and this is not just uh, Billy's actual roamings around the neighborhood, but they really represent Billy's uh, learn, how he is as a learner, um, and is in fact the way a lot of us learn. I think we learn how to play school, right? Which is, I want you to go from point A to point B. And kids do that, they'll do that for you. But you can actually disrupt that um, by really asking them to take greater ownership over that learning. I remember um, one student, I always had a class, I taught physics and chemistry, and uh, my students, uh, in my physics class, I gave them all the materials and I gave them questions, and they need to actually teach one another and work through that. Um, I had one student who came up to me, obviously very successful in school, had, was an 11th grade student, um, had been successful up to that point in her education, and she came up to me and said, Mr. J, just tell me what to do. Um, it's a really scary thought that, um, you know, those kids are playing school, but what happens when school ends? What happens when we're done? What happens about that internal goal? Here we have Billy who um, wanders his way through the neighborhood and eventually finds his way where he ends up wanting to go or where he needs to go. But in fact, what's happening in between is a lot of learning. Um, and we can't afford to deprive the students of that opportunity to really learn in that fashion. Um, wandering is so key. Uh, I don't know, you probably can't read this in the back. But it says, uh, this way, follow me, after three and a half years of wandering in the desert, Mrs. Moses secretly asks for directions. So <clears throat> there's, there's something to be said about the ability to be able to not just wander, but in fact do so in an informed fashion. Wandering is not bad. We all do it. 
Um, if anybody has suddenly looked up at the clock and noticed that it was 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning and you were on your computer and you realized, oh my gosh, what was I doing all that time? You were probably wandering, and wandering is a healthy thing. I do remember, um, for those of you who might be my age, having the row of encyclopedias in the house um, and going to look up the word elephant in the encyclopedia and finding after it very closely elephantiasis. Um, elephantiasis is actually an infection from a snail that plants, you know, it's, it's a, it, it, it infects your whole lymphatic system and people end up with these big, huge legs and it, it's gross. I love looking about elephantiasis. I can care less about elephants. Um, what happens to that kind of wandering, that excitement that comes from actually looking at that? That's where a lot of that kind of learning actually takes place. In terms of other wandering, um, uh, we see actually sort of Moses here looking out over the land, um, and yet uh, he wandered. Um, here's, here is, uh, here's Moses of today, um, who in fact, of course, has his GPS. Now I know you're all wondering, is he using Google Maps or is he working in the Apple Map? <laughs> yeah, Steve Jobs would be rolling in his grave to think that he was the reason that they wandered for 40 years. Um, <laughs> But at the same time, um, it really changes the very nature of what it means to wander. We have technology, um, but it shouldn't just drive us more quickly to the end result. It's absolutely essential that we look at how wandering is, is, is part of the process, um, is part of how we learn, um, and is essential that the learner owns that process as well. So um, this is uh, the last slide on wandering. Um, uh, it says here, entering the middle, they're looking at the map, um, and it says, well, this is just going from bad to worse um, as they're entering that middle part. Well, I think um, we need to teach our students not to dread that. I think there's a tendency, culturally, um, there's a tendency that we don't like to um, establish problems. We don't like to sort of end up at that point where we don't know. We're uncomfortable. We're so driven towards the end result that um, it's embarrassing to get stuck. Um, I know that uh, when I was teaching physics, I did not purposely, I did not work out problems in advance that I was going to do with students. Um, and one of the reasons is when you're up at the board and you're working something out, giving an example, there's something really useful for the kids to see you go, I have no idea where to go from here. Anybody have an idea? Because when those kids end up back at their desks and they're doing work at night, um, or they're doing work in small groups or they're working alone, they don't see the model of actual learning take place. Um, it's all prepared for them. They assume that that's how it's all going to work. If you look at the situation comedy, you look at things on television, everything's worked out. They need to recognize that part of the challenge is the challenge. It is the problem, it is the process. Um, and uh, in other cultures, I know that in parts of Asia, for example, um, students who don't know how to work the problem are the ones who go to the board. And in fact, in many cases, the rest of the class cheers on the student who's working through a difficult part, and they revel in sort of the process of overcoming that. And that's where I think we lose a lot of students, is they're not used to hitting that problem, hitting that problem state, um, and, and really understanding what it means to work through that kind of issue. And again, giving them the opportunity to wander is absolutely essential as part of that. So when do we give students time to wander? What I hear often is, we don't have time, right? We need to cover everything in the curriculum. Well, um, you know, you probably have heard this before, but cover is a pretty good metaphor. Um, the idea is to uncover everything that's in the curriculum, not cover everything that's in the curriculum. And I think that uh, when, you, when you look at, uh, if you don't give kids time to wander, they simply end up exiting school having covered everything, but in fact maybe understanding nothing. Um, and I think having that working understanding and working knowledge is absolutely essential as part of the learning experience. So as part of this is to think about, and I use as a metaphor here, the idea of a puzzle. Um, you wouldn't hand a six-month-old child um, an incredibly complex puzzle, would you? Um, it's just not reasonable. 
But at the same time, you really want that child to explore. You want them to have an opportunity to try something on for size. I mean, a puzzle that comes before this is your standard sort of uh, square into a square hole. We've all done that. This may be the next puzzle that you give a child. Um, this is, of course, cut out of wood. We have a picture of a cow, and it fits in a hole the shape of a cow. Thank you. This is what a good group. Um, so you've obviously been there before. Um, pretty straightforward. We, we set the boundaries. We make it very clear what those are and how that puzzle is going to be completed. But maybe the next puzzle that you give that child looks like this. Okay, so now I kind of get it. I got it, my little six month old head here. I see how I'm gonna fit that puzzle piece in, and now I'm gonna use that in some other ways. I've got multiple pieces, I'm learning some other things along with it, um, and I have to get some constraints, but a little bit more complexity. Uh, ooh, now I have a picture. Okay, this is complex. Um, and it has multiple pieces, and I now need to see how to assemble those pieces. Again, a little bit more complex. I don't have quite the same boundary. I learn a different set of, uh, a set of heuristics, different approaches to be able to address the puzzle. Um, and so I figured this one out in just a few. Um, oh, now I go to three-dimensional. Now I get a chance to think about the relationship to it. Um, and I'm going to build and figure out how to fit that in here. But what's really cool is that first time the child realizes, wait a minute, I don't have to make it fit in that. I can now assemble them however I want to. What a concept um, as they work through that. And so now we end up with sort of the building blocks and we're working with it as any way that we want to and building whatever we want to. Of course, hopefully they have a younger sibling who is regularly knocking it down, um, which gives them an opportunity to start over again um, as they're working through that. Um, we graduate to the Legos. Um, all of us know children who, I have a grandson like that, who love to build exactly what was in the directions. Um, right? I mean, they just sort of that comfort level that comes from that. But then suddenly breaking out of that and really trying to learn how to go through that. I remember when I was a child, I lived on in a house that had a pretty steep hill up the driveway, um, and it was sort of all bumpy concrete. And my goal, because I had a bunch of, of Legos as well, my goal was to build a car that could make it all the way from the top to the bottom and still have operating wheels when it got to the bottom. <laughs> Um, yeah, I have to tell you, I, I built my cars like with 18 wheels on them, and the wheels were flying off as the thing was going down the road. But I had set a goal for myself. I had set a goal about what I actually wanted to achieve um, with, that, with that particular puzzle. Um, and then we look at going to the erector set. Again, breaking out of the mold a little bit more. Um, look at kinetics, uh, connects um, as we look at that. And then ultimately, um, many of you may do this within physics classes. Again, very, very clearly defined piece, but in fact, using anything you want in terms of how you're going to build that bridge. It's absolutely essential that you think as you're working through the kinds of models you're working at school, to think about how are you giving more ownership of that process over to the learner? How are you taking away the puzzle pieces and taking away those constraints and letting this learner own those pieces. The technology doesn't just make it happen. You can create puzzles with technology that have as many shapes and constraints as it has originally. The benefit of the technology is you have a chance to remove some of that and still be able to work with that learner as an educator to be able to help support them as they take increasing risks and increasing uh, ownership over that learning. Uh, this is a model that comes um, <clears throat> out of, I'm trying to remember where, from uh, uh, building skills from any, some particular place, but looking at, um, looking at learner autonomy, um, looking at students as independent, looking at them as, uh, you know, again, critically reflective, thinking about their learning, about that, asking questions, thinking about them being self-directed, decision-making skills, self-aware, collaborative, um, and self-motivated in that process. These are absolutely essential skills that you have today and what makes you successful in what you do. How are we giving kids the opportunity to build that in an environment where it's safe to be able to do that and give them that kind of ownership over their learning? Um, when we think about age autonomy um, and structure, we look at sort of increased autonomy over time is what we should be shooting for and still look at shifting the responsibility that for that structure to the learner or to a group of learners, to that community of learners as part of that process, um, and giving learners rich experiences in which they can use that. 
Um, there's an organization, we do uh, work with the Gates Foundation on a variety of different projects. One funded project that we've been uh, collaborating with, in some sense, with uh, uh, is the group that was called the Shared Learning Collaborative. For those of you who keep up on the news, um, the Shared Learning Collaborative just announced at South by Southwest, I was there last week, that they now have become what's a company called In Bloom. Um, and what In Bloom does is really believe in this whole process of student autonomy and knowing about the student and providing access to that information. Um, ways that teachers can have access to the information without being in the student's face all the time. Um, ways to be able to respond to student needs but at the same time uh, be able to allow the student to be able to work through um, the learning on their own. And that model is really consistent with uh, again, looking at, uh, so here's where we get into the, sort of the, the techie, I'm going to do this for just a little bit, um, about the SIS and the portal, the information about the learner, but then migrating it down into the learning system and then eventually down to the activity. And the whole session, the whole interoperability that has to happen as we fluidly move between those parts of the system. Absolutely essential. Many of you may be familiar with something called uh, the Common Education Data Standards. Um, uh, implementing that kind of interoperability standards is a challenge, but at the end of that process, um, what you get for that investment is huge, which is you don't get a set of disparate activities that are disconnected, but you get a set of coherent activities that can inform one another. And by having that kind of coherent set of activities, you really get at the essence of supporting that learner um, in all parts of their learning. Um, so if we think about informing learning um, and looking at data as part of that process, we can look at sort of three different kinds of queries um, that we can generate as teachers or as students as we're thinking about that information. One is, again, simple data recall. So again, thinking about the student um, in terms of their reflective uh, processes. The second one is uh, looking at sort of a trends analysis for them to look at what am I learning or for an educator to look at the trend in terms of my class or a superintendent looking at the school as a whole um, or looking at levels um, at, at all different levels in terms of comparisons and asking uh, powerful questions. And then at the tertiary level, we look then at causal relationships. And again, that idea of interoperability, that cohesive system, allows us to get access to um, information that we might not normally think of being together. So as you're looking at supporting that learner, you need to think about what's getting in the way of their learning. And a critical component of that, and I mentioned this yesterday when I spoke to the leadership, uh, to the leadership strand, um, is that you know, one example is a school district that saw there was a group of students who just weren't doing well in school. They couldn't figure out why their scores weren't good. They couldn't find a common thread in their instructional system that tied them to one another. They looked like they were completely different. Um, what they did, however, is through interoperability systems, were able to look at the transportation system. You don't typically tie transportation and instruction together, right? Two different worlds, two different pieces. Um, uh, when they finally looked at that, what they realized is that a large number, a large percentage of the students um, were spending an hour or more on a bus to get to school. Well, that's an interesting piece of information that lets us sort of understand what's taking place educationally. And so uh, what they did is they recognized that we can provide educational opportunities for these kids while they're sitting on the bus. And they were really able to address the kind of learning that was happening um, and, and the student achievement that was associated with that simply because they had access to disparate information, again, supporting the learner as part of that process. So if we think about the kinds of questions that we might ask, thinking about different kinds of users, if we look at the student, the student might ask, um, at a lower level, am I on track to be uh, at standard when I take my high stakes state exam? Uh, so again, in the world of Common Core, um, what does that mean in terms of whether I'm ready? They could also ask, am I on track to be prepared for college acceptance? Thinking a little bit further out. Where do I want to go? What do I want to do? And then looking at the next level, how can I pursue my interests and gain the education I need? So again, giving students access to the information they need so that they can really um, think ahead, think about what it is that they want to do. Um, you can't do that without the technology. But these questions are not inherently technical in their nature. Um, and so I think it's important we think about the good educational questions we need to ask and how we can address those. Um, when we think about the teacher, the teacher can say, what resources can I use for my professional development? Thinking about for me so that I can better address student needs. 
The next question is, what are the best techniques to address a particular topic, um, given a population of students like mine? Um, another aspect that in Bloom, and in fact several other organizations, you may be familiar with the Learning Registry, if you're not, you should look into that, um, is uh, looking at not just collecting data about resources, but in fact looking at collecting para data, which unfortunately shares the term para as with parachute, which is not data that comes from the sky, but it's data that comes from, um, that comes from actual usage. Um, and looking at sort of para data to understand what can I use with my students to help them be effective. And again, that's part of that whole learning registry process. And the question that it ultimately is how can I help a particular student? How can I help them? Uh, a question that a principal might ask is does a course sequence predict student readiness? Um, can I have access to that data that helps me think about that? The question also might be is how does teaching style predict the success of students with different kinds of learning styles? really matching those pieces um, as we begin to flex our muscles and look at breaking out of um, the nature of what we call school today and how do we actually help students have access to the right educator at the right time for the kinds of topics that they're working on. Um, and lastly, a superintendent um, might ask a question like, um, what can I expect the cost-benefit ratio to be if I provide schools with more autonomy? Um, in developing and implementing curriculum. The reason I particularly bring this up is that uh, the tendency, going back to our dam, or going back to uh, what we were discussing before, is it's hard to break out of metaphors if you're, uh, excuse me, out of examples like that, if, you don't, if, you're, if you're afraid, if you don't have the information you need to be successful. Um, and it's not just about the student, the classroom teacher, um, it's also about the superintendent who needs to take a risk and needs to try something else, and needs to have access to information that helps them make an informed decision. It's about making those kinds of informed decisions to change the nature of how we learn and teach in our schools. Um, a parent, of course, is an essential part of this. They can say, how can my skills be used to benefit students in my local school, or for that matter, uh, who can I call to help my child with a particular issue that they have? So again, thinking about the whole system, and the role that the parent plays there as well. It's also important to recognize that parents are absolutely critical in terms of accepting and supporting change as you look at your schools. Um, recognizing that without their support, not just fiscally, um, but also their support when a child comes home. Um, I can't tell you how many professionals I've talked to who said, who know that I'm involved with technology and education, say, you know, my kids, when they come home, they can't use the computer until they're done with all their homework. What happens when their homework is on the computer? Um, that becomes a big issue. We have to educate our parents to think differently about the role of technology. How many of you, when you carry a piece of technology around, um, people say, oh, what are you playing with there? The idea that within our society we think about technology as being play. I bet most of you who are here have transcended that point. We don't, we don't think about that. The technology is part of um, our arsenal of tools that we use to be productive. Um, uh, the fact that we enjoy it is a whole other matter. Um, so form definitely, definitely should follow function. Um, the design of the tools and the strategies impact how they're going to actually be used. It's absolutely a critical piece. Um, so often we work in old environments and we try to do new things and it's very hard to make those kinds of changes. It doesn't mean that you need to have the hugest budget in the world. It means you need to be willing to change the very nature of the environment that you're working in and how you're doing it. If that's obvious, um, in fact, asking powerful questions. Powerful questions being questions that are thoughtful and require more than just looking something up on Google to get an answer but powerful questions that really inform um, your teaching or what's happening in your school requires a depth of knowledge and you need to have access to that information. How do we support the iterative processes that underlie, um, that underlie this process? And it's really not about, again, linear learning. It's about Billy, when he's wandering around that neighborhood, is acquiring expertise and knowledge and ways to think about thinking. Um, that metacognition as he's working through that and that gives him the tools that he needs. Um, you, the classroom teacher, the administrator, need to have the opportunity to wander in very, very much the same way in your professional lives. 
Um, it can't always be directed. It needs to be the opportunity to get out there, try something new, um, and, uh, and see how it works. Um, I mentioned this yesterday as well. I think physicians sort of have their own issues in their community, but I think it's really interesting that if you look at what a physician calls the thing that they do, they call it a practice. And I think there's something to be said about that term, practice. Think about what you do as being an educational practice and embrace that term, practice. Um, I don't think we have all the answers. I don't care what you get from your college of education. Um, it's a community of practice. Practice doesn't assume perfection. Practice assumes that you're continuously learning and continuously changing and evolving. And again, it's that wandering that really allows you to be able to learn the things you need that you don't even know that you need to know yet um, as you encounter new learners, new systems, new technologies. So the question is, what do we do with this? What do we do with this kind of information? Um, how is having, is having access to data simply enough? Well, in fact, you know, many educators are prepared, are not, many educators are not prepared to use this kind of data. Um, uh, you know, there's nothing scarier than, uh, uh, than, than having information but not knowing what to do with it. There's a reason that when people are driving, um, when they're about to go off the cliff, they typically don't stare ahead of them. They close their eyes. Um, and if, if somebody were to hand you a steering wheel from the car and it were to come off um, and you couldn't steer, you're probably going to close your eyes too. And that's so often what happens in our schools is um, we know there's an issue. We don't know how to affect change. So we close our eyes and we keep doing what we're doing. Um, having access to information and being thoughtful about how we can use that information is critical to keeping your eyes open and really affecting a change. Do we have? Do we know enough about how children learn to use this? Uh, to learn what, to use what we know prescriptively with our children. How do we educate parents to understand this information so that they can participate as well? Education can't start when they get to the school and end when they leave. It needs to be an ongoing process, and we all know that, right? Everybody in this room knows that uh, you know, if you have parents at home that are supportive, um, you'll have a great opportunity to work with that child. Um, if, uh, if the child doesn't have a supportive family, um, educationally, they, some of them take it on themselves, and I think that's absolutely amazing when that happens. But in fact, it's really the biggest predictor of success as to whether they have, uh, whether they're successful in their education. So the question is, so where do we go from here? Um, it really is about asking those powerful questions. Takes deep content knowledge, as I said, requires a chance to experiment, try some things that are new. Benefits from access to sort of rich data. Rich data meaning that it's data that has lots of depth to it, so you can ask some of those powerful questions. And requires tools to make sense of that data. And those tools are only now emerging, and you should be looking for those tools when you're in that vendor uh, exhibit hall. Um, ask them, how does this help me make better decisions? How does this inform um, my teaching? How does this provide feedback to the learner about what they're learning? Is it simply a good activity, or does it actually inform that process and support that learner in that process? We get the least benefit from sort of the simple questions, and we get, of course, the most benefit from those kinds of tertiary questions that I described. If we look at sort of the game changer in all of this, however, it's really the movement from uh, the user at the top here to an expert at the bottom and then trying to capture what the expert knows and use that to inform learning. So we have a knowledge base, some data facts, and it's that user interface that is so critical in terms of how we get access to the information, not just about me as a learner, but what other people have learned, what information is out there, um, and we're beginning to make progress in terms of these kinds of systems. Um, as we look at this, we then end up plugging in technologies, these explanation mechanisms, um, the ability to be able to um, support the learner as they're continuing to go through the learning process, recognizing where they are in their learning and, and what they need to be able to make the next step. Um, I, I, in a conference, actually, at Intel several years ago, we're working with portable devices. I said that what we don't need, we don't necessarily need port, but we don't need uh, portable digital assistants, PDAs, right? We all carry them now. Uh, what we need is portable digital nudges um, for students. We need things that are irritants, things that know who that learner is, and ask them the hard questions. We don't need it just to be easy questions. We need it to ask them the question that they go, you, I don't want to answer that question. That's not the one that I do well. Well, that's what we need is devices that actually challenge them. And we all need that sometimes. 
So uh, uh, how do we actually build those kinds of tools is sort of where we're going. So where we do best is here. You say you are lying, but if everything you say is a lie, then you are telling the truth. But you cannot tell the truth because everything you say is a lie, but you lie, you tell the truth, but you cannot, but you lie. Illogical, illogical, please explain. You are human. Only humans can explain their behavior. Please explain. I am not programmed to respond in that area. I was a Trekkie. Um, I didn't wear my Starfleet uniform today. Um, you know, important to recognize that technology will only take us so far with this kind of information. Um, it is illogical. Um, and you as educators are the ones who can help make sense of that. I never expect that technology is really going to take you there. Um, it really is going to be you tying those pieces together that's going to really create the change and help learners understand where they need to go. Um, it's really a movement right now from thinking about content developers. Typically in the past, it's been that traditional model, A, on the screen here, um, where we have content developers and publishers who then deliver to the end user products. So it used to be that, of course, the book was the curriculum um, in many cases. I think we know better now. We think about the book as a rich resource that allows us to be able to address the curriculum. We think about all the other resources we can bring to bear. And we think about sort of this content repository, lots and lots of things that we can use, um, and digital learning environments um, that can help us organize and make sense out of those to then address um, the role of the learner, what it is that they actually need to know. Um, content interoperability is absolutely essential. I just put in a plug here. Um, so the ability for content resources from various sources to be used um, and uh, looking at uh, the content repository, I just want to separate the two, repository versus registry. Um, you may be familiar with the learning registry, U.S. Department of Education. Um, registry simply being data about learning resources, not the resource itself. You don't put them all in one bucket. Um, where a repository is sort of a centralized keeper of all those resources. Um, looking at how to tag that with the right metadata so that you can find it. Um, I actually went into a store the other day out on, uh, uh, what was that, on 4th, um, and the, uh, the fellow was desperate. I was looking for, uh, for a particular item, and he knew he had it, right? But he had no idea where it was. And you know, this may be his first time in five years to sell this item. Um, he was desperate. He wanted to find it because he knew he had had that in his inventory. How many times have you had that as a teacher? You knew you had a resource, you knew you could, it was someplace, but for the life of you, you couldn't find where that resource was. Looking at how to tag resources, how to make them findable, particularly as they're increasingly web-based, um, they can be at your fingertips, but only if you can find them. Um, important for you to keep your eyes out, particularly the, the group from uh, KT, in terms of looking at the Learning Resource Metadata Initiative, LRMI, I'll just throw that out for you techies out there, um, in terms of looking at Learning Resource Metadata, um, which is an initiative sponsored by the Gates Foundation that we've been working on. How do you find those resources and how do they work together is absolutely essential in terms of addressing the need of the learner. So um, it's around really acting on the patterns that we see in the data, the things that we visualize, um, the things that we're making sense of. Having access to the information, knowing what it is that uh, you want to know. That seems trivial, it seems like a tautology, but you know, how many times do we ask questions but we really didn't think about what it is that we wanted to know to begin with? Um, absolutely essential to really step back and think about that as you're getting into it. Thinking about actionable information, something I can actually do something about, and then feedback regarding the success of that learning or that kind of paradata that we can use to make sense. The question I have is how can we make this available to all users? How can we um, make it use that you have access to that? Um, and not just to you, the teacher, but the student, the administrator, and the parent as well, so that everybody can participate in that process. Ultimately, are we preparing kids for the cliff? I think it's an important question. So what is the cliff? The cliff is 12th grade. So, um, and so kids, of course, desperately look for some place to go after that. And what I mean by that is that we drive kids, we tend to drive kids off the cliff if we're not preparing them to be independent thinkers. 
because they're looking for, just like that student asked me, Mr. J, what do you want me to do? Just tell me. How do we help them in 12th grade and prior to that um, in terms of beginning to take ownership and ask those powerful questions for themselves is absolutely essential. And what that means is giving up some control yourself um, and, uh, and managing that process. It's okay, really. Call me, you can call me anytime, I'll tell you. It's okay um, to let go of some of that. Um, if they're not allowed to wander, they're not gonna make that. And we don't wanna push them off the cliff like lemmings or buffalo. Um, removing the cliff is about uh, structure and trend. The red line is what we tend to do today, which is we tell them over the period of the school, we tell them, oh yeah, we're giving you a little bit more autonomy, but we're doing it in a way that is sort of trivial. Um, we're still giving them sort of guided support there. And then at the end we tell, okay, now you're on your own. Go do it, figure it out. Versus that yellow line, which is that gradual approach where we're slowly removing it um, and, uh, and, and allowing them to take, uh, to take more ownership over that process. So similarly, um, when we look at that cliff, the autonomy trend should be just the opposite, which is again, looking at how they can work more autonomous, autonomously through that process. And again, not autonomy just coming at the end um, in a way. The benefits that come from this autonomy, as I said before, are tremendous. Um, question development, leadership, communications, um, project management, time management, group skills, negotiation skills, meeting deadlines, what a concept, uh, conflict management, public speaking, presentation. I mean, these are the things that we want kids to have. Um, they'll be able to go out and look up other stuff on Google. You can't look this stuff up on Google. This is not something you're gonna find the answer to on a device. Um, these are the skills that our kids need to have to be able to move to the next step and to become autonomous learners. So what is the right technology? How do we look at moving ahead? Um, and I think it's really important that you allow yourself to dream as part of this process. to my lecture today. Uh, thank you for the uh, Nobel Prize in Education. First one, of course, so I uh, really appreciate that. We're going to talk a little bit about a breakthrough in data-driven decision-making here. Um, so let me go ahead. The problem that we identified as part of this is uh, how can we realize the promise of data-informed education? I know you've heard a lot about it recently, so let's dip into some of the details here. Um, it's really trying for a pragmatic solution, something that is thoughtful and really has an impact in terms of how we practice. It's not just prescriptive information regarding the needs of a particular learner, but it's actually the vague generalities um, required for measurable success in an educational bureaucracy. <laughs> Existing solutions include linear regression, matrix multiplication, astrophysics, uh, Ouija boards, and tarot cards. Um, we found that a lot of educators have problems with the uh, astrophysics, but the Ouija boards seem to work just fine, um, but have low predictive success in terms of what they predicted. So this is just not possible. We can't do this in a large way. We recognize that, so we continued our work. Uh, we sought some research funds from various places. Um, we uh, went to several funders. They include uh, NIH, NSF, NEA, NASA, and for those of you who remember Enron, they didn't have anything left. Um, all said no, and we thought to ourselves, oh gee, where can we go for more money? And oh gee is exactly where? The Office of, the office of Government Ethics. We thought that they must have something left over. Um, given effectiveness there. So uh, we then did a four-year research project and we tried uh, professional development, but what we found out was there was no funding and we realized that the key administrative principle is keep it simply stupid. Uh, you may have heard a variant of that, but we find this is actually a much better way to describe it. <clears throat> we found that a correlation does in fact infer causality. So if you can show correlation, of course it's true, regardless of what you observe. 
and we found that reflective practice is out. You may have all heard of reflective practice, yes, reflective practice. And what's actually in is something that we call refractive practice. Refractive practice is actually in. So let me explain that to you. This is really essential to understanding the technologies that we've developed. The analogy here is reflective practice, the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. Right? Does all look familiar to you? Thank you for nodding your head even if you didn't know. Um, the next is, uh, this provides an image of the original, right, through that reflective practice. The refractive practice is very different. It actually assumes that there's some movement through the medium, and in fact, uh, just as reflective practice provides an image of the original, refractive practice um, bends the truth based on the observer's density. <laughs> I know you've all been there. <laughs> so, major finding what we've, that we got from that is if we take a look at, of course, a prism that breaks light, white light, into its component parts across the spectrum, um, what we find is just as refraction splits the light, uh, we find that this data refraction, DR, um, splits the right and left brain thinking required to interpret the data. Do you follow me? Okay, good. Thank you for one person answering yes. Where are the rest of you? Um, so, we turn to an old technology. We turn to an old technology. Um, and that technology, it's here somewhere. There we go. Uh, we turn to this affordable remote data processing um, and local decoding technology. And uh, each one of you are actually going to get uh, one of these devices. Go for it. I'll give a moment for uh, the uh, blue shirt group. Uh, don't put them on yet, it'll actually damage your retina. <laughs> I always see people do that. I should have had the disclaimer. where being spread out doesn't work all that effectively here. <laughs> Raise your hand if you still need glasses. All right. There we go. Now I can tell which blue shirt group is slackers here. I just have short legs. She has short legs, okay. <laughs> So we're going to go through a couple of examples. Again, don't put them on yet. Get ready with your glasses. Um, we'll do an initial view of this data before you have the glasses. You really get to see the power of the technology. Um, and then we'll put them on uh, when the, uh, and we'll start that remote data processing. You notice the device that you have is very inexpensive. So all the work is actually done remotely. So if you could dim the lights a little bit so that we can get a good view of these. Thank you. Actually, that makes it a lot easier for me to see. Okay. Um, so here's your standard grade book, right? Look familiar? Anybody ever do a grade book like this, right? You've all seen it. Uh, okay, now go ahead and put your glasses on. There we go. You could have spent forever and not known that answer, right? So the remote processing works, it all comes out. Keep the lights dimmed if you can, thank you. And we'll go on to another example here. Okay, uh, another example, go ahead, glasses on. Here we go. <laughs> Leave these children behind. <clears throat> you could have spent forever with those kids and not known that. So this way you don't waste time on them, you can move to a whole new group of students. Let's move to another example. Glasses on. <laughs> Duck and cover. I had that class, right? We all know that class itself. Um, and I think we have one or two more examples coming up here. 
So there's a different kind of grade book, just to show you we can handle different kinds, something a little bit more qualitative. Gender bias detected. Uh, this is actually a problem that we've encountered with the technology. Turns out the silica doesn't really understand concepts of gender. Um, uh, don't do that. Uh, and we have one more here. Here we go. Put your glasses on. Just between you and me. Teach to the test. How to bring up those test scores. So, I think you can see the power of the technology. Again, inexpensive, right? Every teacher can have one of those glasses. And the technology will just actually emerge out of the grade book and tell you what to do. Anybody can do this. Um, it's just as the drive through changed the way we eat. And there's, a, I think, the first jack in the box. Uh, just as that changed it, we need an educational breakthrough. In this case, um, we have the teacher who's driven up. Key features, have it your way. Um, you can have a menu-driven educational system. Um, and you can have reformed base, just like that chicken that they serve in a lot of those fast food restaurants. You'll never look at the word reform again the same way. Um, and she says, can you supersize that curriculum for me? Uh, what are the implications in a teacher shortfall? Um, anybody can now teach. You don't need to have any qualifications. The gradebook will just tell you what to do. Um, increased transparency of the analysis, high face value of the analysis, no need for professional development. Just do what you're told. Um, that'll work fine. Quick answers to complex uh, questions. Our next project that we're working on right now is, of course, a one-to-one -one DR glasses program, because anybody's willing to fund it if it says one-to-one. -one. Um, more portable monocle solution. We found we have some issues with that, however. We don't get much depth of understanding to that. Um, and then the last one, of course, is the rose-colored glasses that makes all schools look like they're meeting I AYP. Um, and I think we've all gone to work with those schools. So uh, I do want to thank you very much for being here for my lecture for that. Thank you so much. individualized versus personalized learning. Um, the data, of course, comes from you. You need to make sense out of that information. It's not going to be done for you by the technology. Um, do we provide the path that the students are going to follow? Or, in fact, does the student provide that path? Um, it's probably a hybrid between those two. We saw that when we looked at those puzzles. It's how we release and give more ownership to the learner over that process. The technology plays a fundamental role in being able to do that in a way that you don't lose the connection with the learner, but in fact still be able to provide support for them in that process. Whoops. Okay, there we go. Um, and about it's about engagement, it's about relevance, it's about retention and the ability to apply um, to new situations. Again, not just for students who are going to encounter those new situations in their lives, it's about you and your ability to be able to accommodate those new pieces. Think about curriculum. I want you to think about this. Think about curriculum as we use the term in the word curriculum vitae. Right? We all have a CV, right? Did somebody give that to you in first grade? No. Your CV, your curriculum vitae, describes who you are, what you did. Um, and think about curriculum as CV, not as curriculum that we give kids and tell them to walk through as we tell them. Um, look at a person's education, their qualifications, previous experience. Individualized means adapting the curriculum and changing that to meet the needs of every learner. And that begins to fundamentally break apart what we think of as curriculum and really allows us to turn towards learning. Personalized means starting with the child. And it's not about adapting, it's about starting with what interests that child and how do we address their needs um, as, we're, as we're going along. We need to provide educators with tools, key to supporting educators as professionals. If anything, there's a lot of educators are afraid that technology is going to take their role 
In fact, if anything, it strengthens your role. What it does is remove from you the tedious tasks, potentially, and give you the opportunity to really engage in a meaningful fashion uh, with your learners. Absolutely essential. Good educators develop intuition about their students, <coughs> academic and social issues, and that doesn't go away. We need to figure out how do you capture that, how do you share that, how do you use that. How do we collect relevant data to replicate what intuition tells the seasoned uh, teacher? That's where our challenges lie as we look at how we use this kind of digital information. It's about transcending the technology. The technology is going to continue to grow. You need to continue to demand the very best. It's about taking advantage of the savings that technology can afford us. It's about transcending the limits of the technology. Don't let the technology limit you, but push it. Push it harder into taking informed ownership of the learning and giving the learner more ownership as you continue to make progress on that direction. The learner needs to own their learning. Absolutely essential. Um, it's about creating critical consumers and sense makers across the whole system. Um, you as an educator, the student, in terms of being a critical consumer of their learning, um, and so what can we do differently today? I try to be really pragmatic about this. Ask higher order questions. Don't ask the simple questions only. Ask the tough ones. Make it hard for those people who are presenting for you today and tomorrow in this conference. Ask the hard questions. Think as a community about the big issues. Better yet, let the students ask questions as well and let them pursue those in your classroom. Don't, st don't push away from those. Coverage is not the only goal. Find ways to engage learners today and really get them involved in their learning. Check items off the learner's list, not just your own. The tendency is we do our list for ourselves. Think about what is it that the learner needs to have? What are the things they need to own in that process? Model learning behaviors, as I mentioned before. Don't always work out the problem in advance. Let them see you get stumped. Let them see you go through the process of learning and model that process with them. Um, and educate your community and reset expectations about what it means to be a learner in today's world. It's not just about memorization. Um, it's about being able to ask those critical questions. There are two initiatives that I do talk about, and I'm just going to just mention them briefly, and I want you to think about them. Oops, and they went away. Hang on. Uh, one is uh, change institution to individual. Ultimately, this is not about institutions. It's about individual learners. And I think you're going to see over the period of the next decade, increasingly, the institution is not going to be the consumer. The learner and the individual and their family is going to take greater ownership over that learning. And you need to really figure out how do you play in a world where that's the case. The other one is, instead of thinking about no child left behind, which sounds like a field trip goal, um, <laughs> We need to think about it as every child helped ahead. Every child has areas where they have aptitude and where they have challenges. Every child has areas that they have aptitude and challenges. And we need to think about how do we support that child in being successful in the things that they want to achieve. And with that said, thank you so much for having me here, and I hope you have a great conference. Thank you. Be sure to visit the uh, vendor booth. Uh